When I played Kuro Games Punishing Grey Raven, I often wondered what this game's aesthetic and combat would look like in an open-world game. Lo and behold, we now have Wuthering Waves, an action RPG and open-world game made by Kuro, available for PC and mobile devices. Sadly, no console for now. It's mostly a single-player needed-to-be online game. But there's also some activity where you can play with other people. And the best thing about this game is, it is free. But like all free games, there's a catch. This is a gotcha game at its core. If you're a gotcha game regular, especially one who plays Genshin Impact, or is a Vegas Strip regular, what in the goddamn? You definitely know what you're getting yourself into. You know, collecting waifus, oh no, saving gotcha resources only to get a raid off, energy system, doing dailies, and etc. But with that being said, the game has been anticipated by dozens of people, 30 million to be exact. So I reckon this might be some people's first experience with a gotcha game. If you somehow see this video first before playing the game, and your RPG and or open world games are on this level, might want to take the bar down a notch. But it doesn't mean you can't enjoy this game, especially for what it offers, not to mention it's free. And so far, I see lots of people do and still play this game, despite some hiccups here and there. All right, enough pleasantries. Let's dive more into the details about this game and see if Wuthering Waves is really for you. Let's start with the gameplay, specifically the game's combat. Wuthering Waves combat is no doubt one, if not its major selling point. Offering combat complexity that is enjoyable to be learned and is very satisfying when you manage to perfect it. But still simple and fun enough if you're just a casual player who doesn't really play fast-paced combat games. The game's combat mechanics inherit PGR combat with some tweaks and additions. You can bring three different characters, which in this game are called resonators, to explore and combat. But sadly, you can only control and view one character at a time, although you can swap between characters any time with hardly any cooldown. And each character in the team can be used to support one another to beat the enemies. Each character also has their own role, element, and type of weapon. For roles, I don't think there's an official term, but it is mostly divided into main DPS, sub DPS, and support. In a game like this, it's best you build your team around your main DPS, but don't let me stop you from making a team consisting of only a middle-aged man. And as mentioned earlier, each resonator has their own element, except for the main character, the rover, who can have multiple elements. Some enemies and scenarios can make your resonator element attack stronger or weaker, so choose the best resonator for the job. Each resonator also uses a certain type of weapon, each with their own playstyle. Obtaining top rarity weapons in this game can be difficult, so luckily weapons can be shared among characters with the same weapon type. Now we'll talk about how the combat on the field works, but first a bit about the enemies you'll encounter in this game. There are four types of enemies, Common, Elite, Overlord, and Calamity. The last two are pretty much bosses and more or less the same, and anything above common have this stagger meter below their health, which can be reduced by any kind of attacks and significantly reduced by counterattack. Once depleted, the enemy will become immobile, and it will be your best chance to unleash hell. As for combat, there's a bunch of moves here. There's basic attack with a combo, heavy, and plunge attack, character skill, and ultimate attack. Simple enough, but there's another thing that adds to the layer of complexity to the combat, this forte circuit. Basically another way for the character to do a special attack or other ability like providing continuous heal and shield and each character has a different way to fill up their forte circuit meter and how to use it, although it's mostly just a slight difference. Also, doing any attacks, counter-attack, and dodging, 
will fill up this thing called Concerto Energy. Once full, when you swap to any character, you will activate the intro skill of whoever you're swapping in, usually doing damage, but some also provide other utility. While activating the outro skill of whoever got swapped out and buff the one who is now your controlling. When swapping Resonator in combat, it's typically best you wait for this first, especially if said Resonator outro skill buff is important for the next Resonator. Besides attacking, the game offers a bunch of ways on how your characters avoid damage. Well, the easiest way to avoid attacks is to dash and dodge incoming attacks. But if you dodge right before the hit lands, you will trigger extreme evasion, which should give you an iframe and slows the time for a moment. And the next attack you did will trigger a special dodge counterattack. Lastly, you can do counterattack which is basically the game's parry mechanic. Some enemies will have this golden halo when they're about to strike, and if you attack them before their attacks hits you, you will parry the attack and decrease the enemy's stagger meter significantly. It's not always an easy thing to do, especially when fighting an agile boss, but very satisfying and rewarding if you can master it. Some characters also have their own unique way to counter enemy hits, for example, Jian Xin can use her skill to easily parry an attack and can generate a shield to resist damage. Moving on, still combat related, we have a feature that makes this game unique compared to other gacha, the Echo System, or in layman's terms, Pokemon. This game's world is filled with dangerous creatures. Unfortunately for them, they have to share it with you. So, when you defeated almost every enemy in this game, world boss included, you will have a chance to capture them as an echo. Then you will need to place those echoes in the five available slots. But you can only use the echo's ability when they are in the first slot. Different echo will provide different things. Most will attack the enemy, but some can provide buff, healing, parry, and even a way to skip legs day. Whatever it is, Equipping an Echo will increase your Resonator stats, based on what that Echo stat buff is. But even though it's the same creature and rarity, the kind of buff they give is still random. You can also level up the Echo and tune them to unlock additional buffs. But again, the stats are random. Each Echo also have different Sonata effects, and when two or more Echo with the same Sonata are equipped, your Resonator will receive the corresponding Sonata effect, but the Sonata effect will not be triggered if you are equipping the same creature. And as mentioned before, each Echo also has their own rarity. The bigger the rarity, the more and bigger stats buff they can give. But keep an eye on this cost limit. Different creatures type will have different cost. And as you might have guessed, you can't equip more Echo if you already reach the limit. I can see this whole feature is a mix of PGR cup and memory system. Or if you're not familiar, Echo is Genshin artifacts, more or less. For an open world game with plenty of creatures roaming around, Echo is one of the best things this kind of game could have, because it adds more purpose to exploring the world and makes that exploration and combat more rewarding. Furthermore, there's a neat progression system by collecting echoes called the data bank. The more you level up, the bigger your chances to obtain an echo, and it also give a decent number of gacha currency, upgrade materials, and character stamina cap increase on every level. And the best thing is, you can get most of the good echo by collecting them in the world without consuming in-game energy. Although there are indeed some dungeons where you should have a higher chance to obtain a certain echo of your choice. But I think people mostly use this for echo upgrade material that is also awarded upon completion. Overall, finding and upgrading the perfect echo for your team can be a grind hell. The PGR grind really starts to kick in here with this system. But it typically won't be a problem for you who only play the game casually and progressing at your own pace. Okay, we talked enough about combat and a bit more about Echo. Now, as an open world game, 
The quality of the game world is very important to discern whether it's a game of the year or just game in this year. So let's see, and talk about the world of Wuthering Waves. The world of Wuthering Waves is called Solaris 3, or Sol 3 for short. And as a player, we start our journey in one of these planet nations, called Huang Long, specifically the city of Jinzo and its surrounding area. I'm not sure what to compare this game map with, but it is pretty big, about three clicks give or take. But do note this is a live service game with new contents, including new areas will be added in the future. So I guess you can already tell how big this game world can be. Here's hoping each new area will be exceptional and new quality contents that comes alongside it. The city of Jinzhou, and I suppose the entirety of Huang Long, is inspired by Chinese culture. So you'll see some pretty Chinese architecture and aesthetic while exploring. Overall in PC, the game's world combined with the highest graphics setting makes it a very nice looking game. Even at the lowest setting, it's still pretty gorgeous although I don't know how it looks on mobile devices. And lucky for you, game photographer. This game has a photo mode to capture the game's beautiful scenery. Either do it from the menu or instant utility screenshot. Photo mode is always a nice feature to have, but honestly, the game's photo mode is just bare bones. There's not much you can tweak. The camera control is somewhat awkward. And from what I've seen, a single character can have three idle animations. But in the photo mode, you can only view their standby pose. Well, photo mode is definitely not a big deal, and I would rather the dev focus on fixing more important issues. Besides, you can still get some beautiful pictures. We have talked about how beautiful the game world is, but don't let it fool you. Jinju also serves as a border and fortress against the tacit discord invasion, which is pretty much almost every monster you see in the game and those echoes you're carrying around. And as a border city that must defend itself against God knows what. Some parts of the map can look very eerie and war-torn, and while you often see people in the city enjoying their lives, know that there are military outposts filled with soldiers trying to keep the TD at bay and preserving this world fragile peace. But with that said, it's not the most alive or immersive world I have ever seen in video games. The city of Jinzhou can feel rather dull, with civilians mostly just staying put, with minimal interactions with each other and hardly any interaction to the player character. And probably the thing that makes me not immersed into this world the most is that other than the main story and some quests, there's hardly any voice acting here. Not even a simple. Good to hear. Goodbye. Goodbye. And petting an animal is sadly just an illusion. I really thought they'll have an animation for it. Well, I do understand immersion may not be the game's focus, especially since they also need to consider mobile players. And clearly there are more glaring issues right now. On the bright side of things, I found out that creatures around the map can interact with each other, although it is mostly indulging themselves in the good old fisticuffs. You will also see soldiers patrolling close to a city or military outpost plenty of times, and will attack any hostile on sight. There's also this one where guardsmen will greet you whenever you enter or exit an area. And I like how shopkeepers have this animation whenever you visit and buy their wares. Well, overall, those are only small things to add to the immersion. But you know, we gotta appreciate all the small things in life. All right, back to the exploration. Exploring and traveling this vast and treacherous land is mostly done by doing cardio. Luckily, sprinting costs no stamina outside of combat. You can also climb almost any wall you see. But since we're a cool person, we can do a wall run to navigate around the area quicker and there's some sort of glider to be used from heights. Also, you got a grappling hook that is similar to Monster Hunter Rise wire bug, used to instantly move to a grappling point scattered around the map or reaching a higher ground in an instant. 
And yes, you can also use this for plunge attacks. Fast travel is also an option. You can fast travel to any of these beacons on the map. With the beacons mostly placed near important story places or dungeons for convenience. But you need to travel to the beacon first and activate before you can fast travel. All and all, the developers did a good job at making traveling and navigating around the map quick and easy. Swimming is still pretty boring though. And like any other open world, to make your exploration experience more interesting, the whole map is filled with side quests, treasures, collectibles, puzzles, challenges, lore bits and such. And don't forget about those monsters that you can collect. Because of these things, I often chose not to fast travel if my target location is close enough. For the reason, there might be something new or something I missed along the way. Moving on, I want to talk a bit about how the game rewards your exploration and its progression. The game highly encourages and rewards you for exploring and completing activity in the game's world. For example, there are these yellow sonance caskets scattered around the map. That can be collected and exchanged for rewards. Not only will you be given valuable goodies, but also rover ascension material and duplicates that can't be found anywhere else. There's also the Pioneer Association that rewards your exploration progress by yet another valuable stuff, but also some unique gadgets to make the exploration and finding hidden stuff easier. Last one is this souvenir shop. While exploring, I guess typically when finding a chest, you will get an exploration currency and can exchange them for items available. Okay, for the next thing we will talk about, it's an important thing that can make a game more immersive and create an engaging experience for the player, and what makes some old games still played and talked about today, and that is none other than the game's story. Currently, I have completed the final story act in Wuthering Wave's current version. And I gotta say, the story leaves so much to be desired. I feel like some parts of the story are rushed and sometimes can feel weird. Some people even think the story is overwhelming with how many foreign words they throw at you. For how weird the story can feel, I have few examples. There is a scene where Jian, a military general, Ask the rover where he should put his soldiers on the battlefield, and let the rover choose where they should target this big guy with their cannon, which if the rover made a wrong decision, everyone would pretty much be dead. At this point of the story, the rover is already seen by most as some sort of the chosen one and a capable fighter with some divine power, but not so much as a strategist, and it's the first time the rover sees this battlefield. So it's weird that it's not a general or other high-ranking officers who have seen similar situations in the past do the planning and issuing orders. Not to mention the game just creates an illusion of multiple choice and outcome. No matter what, you will eventually progress in a path that is already prepared by the dev. At best, you can either choose to inquire a person to learn more about their motives and game lore, or skip their babbling entirely. Then another weird thing that seems to be a case of an oversight. If I remember this right, story-wise, the rover will only start calling herself by the nickname you have given at the end of the main quest, specifically when asked by this guy. Before I forget to mention, the rover has amnesia, so pretty much everyone has been calling her rover until this point where she came up with a new name. But weirdly enough, some NPC already know this new name when they first meet her, way before I get to the final act. Well, clearly it's not a big deal, and I'm sure you viewers also think the same. But right now, I think one of the biggest concerns about story experience is the character voice. Knowing that voiced characters are mostly in the main quest is already painful enough, but it's even worse when knowing the default dub, English dubbing is not at a satisfactory level. Oftentimes, the English dub really makes conversation between characters sound awkward, and monologue is even more painful to hear. 
and I think there's even an audio mixing issue. I once believed this is what I will surely get when playing anime gacha games. But after playing Reverse and hearing the newer batch of Ark Knight's English dub, I am now certain it's not the case. No offense to the voice actors if they somehow see this, and I doubt we are in this situation entirely because of the VA. Anyway, hope in the future they can improve the English voice acting. Overall, I think the story is hardly this game's selling point, or at least not yet, especially in the earliest part where it doesn't do well to make a good first impression. That being said, it's not all bad and no good. The story does have its own memorable and interesting moments, especially nearing the end. All right, next up we'll talk about the gacha system, which is no doubt a very big deal in a gacha game. In Wuthering Waves, the main thing to gacha is character and weapon, with character mostly seen as the priority. And this is the drop rate of each item rarity. One might think this is not a generous rate, and not to mention there's a 50-50 system at an event banner. But I think for this kind of game that only has few characters upon release and only few additions on every update, it's a pretty standard rate. And to ease your worry, there's a guarantee system on every couple of pulls, shared guarantee, and a pity system. There are also plenty of ways to get gotcha currency, particularly in early game. Not to mention you get even more if you buy the monthly card and or battle pass. Wuthering Waves, for better or worse, has multiple gotcha tokens. But you mainly use this premium currency to exchange for those tokens like any other gacha games. When you first start, you will have a beginner banner. And in Wuthering Waves, this beginner banner will guarantee you a five-star character within 50 pulls. And at a discounted price with only eight Lust Road tied, instead the usual 10. But once you get a five-star, the banner will then be closed. And it is very recommended you start your journey to gambling addiction in this banner. Then, there's another special choice banner for new player. If the previous one will give you a random 5-star, this one will give you the 5-star that you have selected to get. But the pull price and guarantee are increased, and it's the price you'll often see in this game. Then there's the event banner, the rate-up banner that I suppose will typically feature new characters. And unlike the previous two, this one will require different token to pull. The banner also has a 50-50 and pity system, which means if the first 5-star you get isn't the rate-up character, your next 5-star is guaranteed to be the rate-up. And yes, the guarantee count is shared and can be carried over to the next event banner. So you can build pity, but don't blame me if you spark a 5-star. There's also the event weapon banner, which usually features the event character signature weapon. And yet again, requires different token. Fortunately, Kuro went a little generous with the weapon banner, as you are guaranteed to get the weapon in 80 pulls. Next, there's the standard, or permanent character and weapon banner, which use those blue crystal tokens. For the character banner, you are guaranteed to get one of these five star in 80 pulls. While in the weapon banner, you can choose which weapon to focus on and you're guaranteed to get that weapon in 80 pulls. Additionally, pulling gacha banners will give bonus currencies to be exchanged for items in the shop, including character duplicate material. Well, I suppose that is all I can say and important things I can show you about this game. So ladies and gents, should you play Wuthering Waves? I think Wuthering Wave's combat and its world exploration are this game's best-selling point, with plenty of starting contents, and new contents will be updated to the game to keep yourself engaged, not to mention the beautiful graphics and character model that can make you stay in the game for a long time. The game is also free-to-play friendly. Of course, there will be a gap between F2P and people who spend money in this game, but you should be able to enjoy it without even spending a single dime. And Kuro is famous for being generous since early PGR days. I mean, there's a lot of freebies they give upon the game release, 
including a freaking five-star ticket. But like any other games, Wuthering Waves isn't free from any issues. And some freebies I mentioned earlier are given because of the game issues. Some of the glaring issues with the game right now that seem to be encountered by the majority of the player base are the technical issues and unpolished translation that not only affected story dialogue, but also items description. There's also some small things like dialogue line being cut before the character finishes talking. And at one point in my game, music and ambience sound just gone, although for technical issues such as game crash and massive frame drop. So far, my gameplay has been pretty smooth even at the highest setting. There's indeed a noticeable frame drop in the city, but still playable for me. But if there's any big problem I encountered, it's probably the ping. Sometimes it will just spike randomly, especially when fighting multiple enemies. It becomes really frustrating when I remember this is mostly a single-player game, and time-based challenge mode or dangerous bosses can become really punishing when those red ping hits. Luckily, despite all this mess, the developers are transparent to the game issues and are very open to feedback, so we can hope this game will become better in the future. That should be all. Adios.